This is a macroalgal rocky reef habitat in Batemans Bay on the south coast of New South Wales. It is not in a marine sanctuary zone and recreational fishing is allowed. The kelp and other growth is providing food, cover, structure and building blocks to support a rich web of life from small organisms to large fish extending from the sea floor to the water surface and beyond. And as fish in these layers congregate, rest and feed, predators like these yellowtail kingfish and bonito are drawn in to hunt. A few hundred metres away on a rocky reef surrounded by sand, small fish stream in seeking cover from predators. This rich habitat with fringing kelp is a sessile invertebrate reef, also known as a sponge reef. The sponges, soft corals and other life are rich in colour and diversity, like these slow-growing Gorgonian fans. Sponges, soft corals, social and colonial ascidians, bryzoans, hydroids, seaweeds and more seem to cover every inch of this isolated rocky reef in Batemans Bay. This diverse benthic life supports a rich web of fish life around and above it. This place is also not a marine sanctuary and is open to recreational fishing. And then nearby are these. These are long-spined sea urchins, Centrostephanus rogesi. And these are urchin barrens, also known as coralline urchin communities or coralline flats. Barrens in New South Wales are a divisive and debated issue. They are usually low productivity areas, devoid of large seaweed and sessile invertebrates. They occur on nearly 600 kilometres of New South Wales coast, with many visible on Google Earth as pale rock. Most nearshore divers, snorkelers and fishers encounter them every trip. The barrens in New South Wales are either a natural part of the underwater environment, or, like many others around the world, an environmental catastrophe caused by humans. There is little middle ground. In the catastrophic scenario, heavy fishing of urchin predators decades ago allowed extensive areas of kelp and other growth to be grazed to barren rock by a ballooning population of urchins. This brought immense impacts that continue today to First Nations sea country and coastal economies. There is not enough scientific evidence yet for conclusive proof of how our barrens arose, and debate and research is continuing. This film shines a light on the possibility of a human cause, the nature of the New South Wales urchins and barrens, and key questions. We use our interviews with experts, our underwater footage and mapping, fishing history data and other sources. We show the relevance of the New South Wales urchins and debate to Tasmania, recommendations for action and hope for the future. We spoke with Dr Pia Winberg, who has many years of research experience studying marine ecological systems in the northern and southern hemispheres. She is a global expert on phycology, the study of marine algae such as kelp, and is an expert in the health benefits of seafood. Sea urchins are a natural herbivore of, um, of the ecosystem. And it's, it's normal that sea urchins eat seaweed, that's nothing new. But when an imbalance happens in the ecosystem and there are too many urchins, then they start tearing down the forest, so to speak, uh, and it changes the whole ecosystem. It's called a regime shift 
it means something's flipped on its head and it's a totally different balance and you lose a lot of the ecology and the organisms that were there. In this case, fish and other organisms that would otherwise live in, breed in, feed on the seaweed and macroalgae can't exist there anymore, so they're gone. Uh, and that's what's happened with the sea urchins. is due to a number of factors, but in part predation's disappeared, climate change factors. Um, it, it means that sea urchins have taken over huge tracts of thousands of kilometres of area of coastline around the world and in southeast Australia, temperate reefs in particular. It has been estimated 50% of shallow rocky reef from Port Stephens to the Victorian border are urchin barrens. This is shallow water where barrens can be seen from satellite and aerial photos. Long-spined urchins have invaded Victoria and formed barrens and via urchin larvae have invaded and continue to invade south across to the Flinders Group and eastern Tasmania. Long-spined urchins are actively forming barrens with many negative impacts. Let's have a look at barrens in Batemans Bay. We will start at the Tollgate Islands Marine Sanctuary. We can see large grey areas surrounding the islands. Are these urchin barrens, sand, gravel or something else? We can use a combination of side scan data we have generated and underwater filming by ROV to identify which areas are urchin barrens. We can use our side scan data of Greater Batemans Bay and identify more barrens. These are barrens from about 5 metres to about 14 metres water depth and are based on 2014 imagery. The barrens dominate the continuous reef of many rocky shorelines, islands and headlands. Deeper barrens are large, extend to at least 25 metres water depth and are still being investigated. So what do the barrens look like? Every round black shape in this image is a long-spined sea urchin. There are thousands upon thousands in this barren alone. They look to be thriving, but they are not. These urchins are starving, barely surviving on what they can scavenge. They have little row and are worthless as urchin industry product. Urchins can remain in this state for many years. It is difficult to say when, as we will talk about, but it is likely that long-spined urchins ate all of the large seaweed here decades or more ago. Any kelp or other life trying to grow is eaten very quickly by urchins and the rocks remain barren of seaweed and most sessile invertebrates. There is little complex benthic life and little support for fish through the water column. Here, like in large parts of the bay, most continuous reef from 5 to at least 15 metres water depth are urchin barrens. Most large seaweed remains where urchins do not have access. Sand is a known natural barrier to urchins. Urchins have difficulty crossing it. So where we have broken reef with patches of rocky reef in sand, we still have kelp. Here we look out from a barren with urchins across a small patch of sand to a small rocky reef with kelp. It is obvious that conditions on the barren are right for kelp and it should have kelp, but it doesn't because of the population of urchins. Large seaweed also remains near abundant urchins in the turbulent zone from zero to about five metres water depth. This is a common occurrence and is known as fringe kelp. The urchins avoid this zone where spines can be broken by moving seaweed. We spoke with Dr. Robert Stenick, who is Professor of Oceanography, Marine Biology and Marine Policy at the University of Maine. He has decades of experience studying the interactions of fish, lobster and sea urchins in kelp and tropical environments and has studied sea urchins from a biological and geological perspective. He is highly published and a recognised global expert. They shunt their energy that would go into growth or reproduction to repair their spines. In other words, that's their priority. It's sort of like building their defences first and then they'll uh, then they will go ahead and, and grow and get bigger and then they will, you know, do other things. Being in an environment, especially a turbulent environment, where spine breakage would be happening on a daily basis, it, it's just maladaptive. And so the easiest thing for urchin to do is to avoid those areas. And here we see the fish life staying with the zone the long-spined urchins avoid as we move into the quiet of the barrens.
Fish like this large blue morwong sometimes linger near remnant-like patches of kelp. These small patches are in places urchins have difficulty accessing. Either whiplash zones where wave action affects the bottom more and keeps kelp moving, or on patches with sand and gravel. So we can see long-spined urchins may have little accessible kelp left on which to feed on some continuous reefs, and so those urchin barrens may not be getting larger. Long-spined urchins do seem to be slowly expanding a barren on this sessile invertebrate reef. Now this is a very important question. In the barrens, many urchins are very exposed, but are not predated on. In kelp environments, the urchins are usually hiding in crevices during the day. In barrens, many are out in the open, completely exposed, even in sanctuary zones where there should be enough large predators. Why are the urchins not being eaten? If they are eaten, the kelp may grow back. First, we will have a look at an example of predation. Urchins are not an easy meal, with long spines and a very strong test, or shell. Not many species of fish can break into an urchin. Sometimes it is only the larger fish within a species that can. This is a blue groper, actually a species of wrasse, filmed near the Tollgate Islands, trying to break into an urchin. Our ROV had removed some spines, that small white patch, and the groper saw a weakness and an opportunity. The groper charges again and again at the urchin, trying to break in. The groper has finally broken through. The urchin releases its grip on the rock and all of the other fish come in to get what they can. A strong mouth and long eye to mouth distance are needed to feed in this way. Gropers can occasionally be seen swimming with urchin spines sticking out of their faces. It is interesting that the spines removed by the ROV were enough to make this urchin attractive. We can see why urchins try to avoid losing spines in turbulent kelp. It is also interesting how many fish and species of fish are attracted to this event. Perhaps it doesn't happen often. So why do we have multitudes of exposed urchins in urchin barrens? Why are they not eaten? Are their spines too long for most predators? Will predators get injured trying to eat them? the feeding apparatus of fish matters. Some of the yeah. wrasses and triggerfish both have, uh, for long spine sea urchins, they actually are very effective because they have eyes that are set far back from their mouth. Their mouth is, protrudes quite a bit. Snapper are known predators of urchins, but there are no known published records of their method of predation in Australia. A very recent New Zealand video posted by Nick Shears is fascinating. In a marine reserve, very large snapper can be seen searching for urchins to eat. They closely inspect, test and reject ones just over the right size. Then when finding one that can fit in their mouth, bite it, rip it off the rock and chew it whole. If this method holds in Australia, long-spined urchins would very quickly become too large for even a large snapper. Our snapper may also be limited by eye mouth distance in the length of spines they can negotiate. More research is needed. Do predators just not want to eat the urchins in barrens? If, if urchins start getting starved, they, their reproductive efficiency drops, uh, their gonad index uh, drops, um, and sea urchins have very low food value um, when they are in just a, a non-reproductive state. They are calcium carbonate, seawater, and a little bit of protein, but not much food value. So the attractiveness to predators would also decline. There's no point in having to deal with those spines, and there's certainly critters that can deal with the spines. Um, but if there isn't gonad, then uh, it becomes less attractive. A 2014 study found lobster in California had a strong preference against malnourished urchins in barrens and in favour of healthy urchins in kelp. They thought the lobster might smell chemicals in excrement 
or notice differences in spines and decide not to feed. Might this very interesting finding also hold for our lobsters and perhaps fish? I mean, what fish often do is they sample a little bit. And if they're not getting gonads, then they probably would just avoid them. Perhaps these feeding preferences help explain why we still have many urchins in our long-standing marine parks where predators have had time to grow. Will abundant malnourished urchins like this ever be removed purely by marine protection? Can this environment even sustain many large predators? We may even find that in some large areas like this, urchin predators are eating virtually no urchins because the urchins are all malnourished and have no accessible kelp. Remaining kelp is all in the fringe, with blash zones, or on broken reef. When and how did the barrens form? These are big questions. The biggest questions of all are did they form after colonial settlement, and was heavy fishing the cause? The extensive barrens are hard to date directly from observations. Aerial photographs show barrens at Bear Island and Long Bay in Sydney in 1951. Aerial and underwater photography was not common until much later. First Nations people's knowledge is helping. We can also be informed by global experiences and history of urchin populations on short and very long timescales. In a nutshell, I think that predators uh, have, have controlled sea urchins globally. The, uh, the peak of when sea urchins were the dominant herbivore um, was the Mesozoic, about the same time when dinosaurs were roaming around. In the Eocene, the, the nature of fish predators um, really fundamentally changed globally. One of the most amazing changes in, ha happened in shallow seas. And uh, virtually every place where, where uh, predatory fish became abundant, sea urchins became rare. And, and they're not the only predator. Of course, the sea otters famously a predator of sea urchins, and, and so are lobsters. Spiny lobsters, there's good data from California, from Southeast uh, Australia, showing um, it's not just the presence of the lobster. It has to be relatively large lobsters that, uh, that are really capable of controlling um, the larger sea urchin abundance. The lobster fishery, like all fisheries, usually has its first impact on, on body size. And it happens that the largest lobsters are most capable of removing the largest sea urchins. And the largest sea urchins have the biggest grazing effects. So you could actually have a fair number of, uh, of lobsters and, um, and, not, uh, and not really see the predation effect if you don't have the large lobsters. People love lobster. From 1874 until 1955, there were virtually no restrictions on harvest other than minimum size. People could take as many and as large as they could catch. The population of the world's largest spiny lobster, the Eastern Rock Lobster, went through drastic changes along the New South Wales coast. This graph of lobster landings in New South Wales from 1894 to 2019 is revealing. People fished from open, non-powered vessels until the 1940s. There is a steep climb in catches from 1920 to 1928, and then a very sharp drop in 1929 and 1930. This is thought to be when known sources had been heavily fished down and there were much fewer lobsters left to catch, large or small. The known sources were of course close to shore, where open boats could reach, where the barrens are now. Those nearshore stocks built up again during the war and were fished down again in 1950. Could barrens have been established during the escalation in catches before the crash in 1930, or the build-up from 1945 to 1950? If lobster prefer not to eat urchins in barrens, or the very large individuals were the largest urchin eaters, would the barrens recover? The stock continued through turmoil with deep water sources found and heavily fished. Restrictions brought the stock into recovery in the 1990s, and it continues to recover. Snapper have always been popular fish. They were and continued to be very important to First Nations people and were a vital food source for the growing colony, with large numbers of smaller fish in estuaries. 
the big, powerful, tough-looking redfish on rocky reefs close to shore and out to sea were revered and sought after. Having powerful jaws and robust heads, they were first called light horsemen. There were concerns of very large snapper, up to 15 kilograms, the natives, as they were known, were disappearing from headlands as early as 1890. Forty years old or more and slow growing, fish like these are not replaced quickly. Particularly as some snapper have been shown to have high sight fidelity, they may stay on the same reef for years. Club fishing charters with 30 to 40 anglers on board were very popular as early as the 1900s and some huge catches were recorded. Catches varied but regularly catch rates would be 5 to 10 and even up to 30 snapper per person per hour. Catches of over 1,000 snapper on the boat. These catch rates continued up to the 1950s, but boats were travelling further to find snapper, indicating that at the very least local depletions are occurring. Combined with commercial fishing, significant changes were probably occurring in the numbers of large fish near shore right along the coast. An experienced South Coast charter operator shared his records from 2014 to 2020. Over 648 trips, clients averaged less than 0.2 snapper per person per hour. He considers a 4 kilogram fish very large and he hasn't landed an 8 kilogram snapper in over a decade. There was a long escalation in commercial and recreational catches from the early days and a sharp increase in 1940 and 1950. Might barrens have formed at any time during the escalation of fishing pressure? Do our snapper feed like those we saw in New Zealand and are restricted in the size of urchin they can eat? Did barrens start like spot fires when too many large fish were removed from an area, with more and more urchins surviving into adulthood, grazing and forming barrens? Would a barren be inevitable if these large fish were removed? Did urchins just become too numerous for fewer fish, or was the combined loss of snapper and lobster too much to control the urchin population? In a scenario where heavy fishing caused the barrens, then given the fishing pressure for lobster and snapper developed in Sydney, then spread outwards as depletion happened, the Sydney region may have the oldest barrens on the coast. The Bear Island and Long Bay barrens could be decades old, even in 1951, especially if the very large snapper were disappearing as early as 1890. It's like for almost any fishery, and it's been so well documented that usually the largest individuals are the first to go. Um, and that's important when it comes to uh, adult sea urchins, which ha actually have the biggest grazing effect. So uh, we're not talking about an absence of, of predators. We're talking about uh, an, a, a, re a significant reduction in the process of predation because the, the, the importance of the largest um, individuals uh, is diminished by fishing pressure. You know, I, I, would, I would broaden it to say that um, I'm not aware of any places uh, that have been examined uh, where um, predator, especially fish predators are abundant and mobile benthic invertebrates are abundant. And uh, so in most places that includes lobsters, crabs, and sea urchins. Um, in the case where the large predators uh, happen to be lobsters, um, and that, you know, there are a couple of places where that tends to be the case, um, you often will see, in fact, uh, a very strong fishing effect uh, when when it just even gets started in those systems. So I'm not, I'm not, I said in my review paper that I, I think that globally, I don't know of any well-documented exceptions that when you get into these hyperabundances of sea urchins where it is um, uh, pretty much only a coralline sea urchin community, uh, all of those seem to be uh, the result of um, predator ex extirpation. Predator extra you know be, predators being removed by humans thank you
most sea urchins, I don't know of any exceptions. I think most sea urchins are omnivores. Uh, you know, these coralline bottoms, uh, they typically don't have much in the way of sponges, bryozoans, or, or, or tunicates because they're, they're all raised. Professor Stenick mentioned the coralline urchin community. We are now in a barren in the Tollgate Sanctuary, which is just that. There is little else but rock encrusted in coralline algae and long-spined urchin. The quiet of the barrens is not an exaggeration here. Neither is the term marine desert. We see no fish whatsoever for long periods. Nothing moves. Do these scattered tunicates hint that there once was a sponge garden here? Where are the fish? There are none in the holes, crevices, overhangs, or around the urchins. Here are some very tiny fish. There's nothing else but rock encrusted in a hard coralline algae with a green tinge. Nothing moves. Kelp, invertebrates and fish usually thrive in terrain like this. Here it is a moonscape with urchins. There are still no fish. The silence is deafening. We travel lower and slower to look for moving life and stop and look amongst groups of urchins, but nothing. The lack of life is unsettling. What if this is the real endpoint of urchin barrens, where urchins without predators have eaten, collapsed or ruined the habitat for nearly everything and are stopping anything coming back? What if other barrens that have more life now are just on a slow journey to this state? Are they monitored enough to know? Did heavy fishing in the past cause this? Would life return if the urchins were removed? What could be hurt by trying? We travel on, passing occasional fish and come to some small stands of kelp. It appears that small patches of sand have given this kelp protection from urchins, as we have seen in other places. It shows that conditions here support growth of kelp. If urchins were removed, kelp and other life may well have a chance of success. We come to a place which is higher and craggy. Travelling up, we find a few small sponges, other invertebrates, and a few fish. Do these small communities of life hint of what was? After several hundred metres, we come to the edge of the barren. Here we see thin patches of sand that separate the hundreds of thousands or more of starving urchins on the barren from the kelp on the right. It is interesting how little sand is needed to provide protection. All of the continuous reef in this place has been accessed by urchins and is barren. Only the broken reef in sand has kelp. The broken reef with kelp is poorer habitat for many fish, shellfish and invertebrates than kelp habitat on continuous reef. The often quoted 50% of rocky reef south of Port Stephens being barrens is probably much higher for a continuous reef in some places. Maybe 80% or more of continuous reef in Batemans Bay is barren habitat and other places are similar. It is possible nearly all continuous reef with access to urchins may become barrens in time. And now we will look at one more urchin predator and offer some thoughts for its future. A predator that was heavily spearfished after barrens were observed in Sydney, but one that may play a key role in avoiding barrens forming now. 
blue grouper are much loved by many people. They are a large, iconic fish and are the state marine emblem for New South Wales. They are slow growing to a maximum of about 25 kilograms, live to over 35 years old and are very inquisitive. Once they reach 30 centimetres in length, they begin specialising on feeding on urchins like this one that we are watching and listening to breaking into an urchin. They attack front on like this or from the side when the urchin is exposed. Research has shown they become very attached to a single rocky reef and may stay on it for years, not crossing sand to leave. They are almost like dedicated, hard-working gardeners, clearing and eating urchins as they find them. They were spearfished very heavily in the 1950s and 1960s until it was banned in 1969. The population had been halved and the number of large fish was greatly reduced. Urchin numbers grew threefold and barrens would very likely have formed and grown as a result. Spearfishing for groper remains banned, but it is legal to catch and keep two groper per person per day by line with one over 60 centimetres. They need to be targeted when fishing for them with specialised bait. They are not common bycatch. Fishing for large groper does have a profile in various media and techniques and locations are shared. Recreational fishers may not be aware that large fish may not be replaced quickly and what it could mean for a reef if large groper were removed. For example, there are isolated rocky reefs in Batemans Bay and elsewhere that are surrounded by sand and some so far do not have urchin barrens. Our dedicated urchin gardeners can often be seen roaming the sponge gardens and kelp beds and most likely looking for urchins to eat. Loss and non-replacement of these fish would almost certainly result in formation and expansion of barrens. Large groper are often just seen in ones or twos, but this small, very special reef has a resident group of around 15 groper, with about six large fish. A group of recreational fishers targeting groper could easily and legally remove these large fish in just a few days. It is unlikely the reef would recover. Adult long-spined urchins are active on this reef, and a barren would very likely form and expand. The large fish and probably much of the habitat and other fish these groper help preserve could be lost. We would like consideration given to fully protecting the blue groper and not allowing any groper that are caught to be kept. The recreational fishing community may be supportive of changes if they see the vulnerability of the groper and the importance of them in maintaining reefs. If the barrens do not have a natural origin, the impact has been very large on the environment and on people, even now. For example, many thousands of people, like our fisher here, fish our rocky headlands. Our fisher doesn't target groper. He may think he is at a place rich in seaweed and resident fish like brim and black drummer, but he is seeing the fringe kelp, the near surface kelp urchins can't reach. Below is a different story. We join his cast and we see that there are many long spined urchins and extensive barrens on continuous reef with some patchy whiplash kelp. There is less support for rich fish life than he may have thought. Here we see where our fisher is located and that virtually every island and headland with continuous rocky reef suitable for kelp instead has extensive barrens. And this is the case for many rocky islands, headlands and nearshore reefs from Port Stephens into Victoria. Many areas of barrens on the New South Wales coast, including our fishers, can be seen on publicly available sites like Google Earth or Six Maps. Here is Twofold Bay and the town of Eden on the New South Wales Government Spatial Site, Six Maps. Zooming into the northern side of the bay, we can see the green fringe kelp and darker patches of whiplash kelp. 
and the large grey expanses of longspine urchin barrens extending out from the fringe. A wider view shows two kilometres of almost unbroken barrens. And this is confirmation underwater. But a little further down on this expanse of barren rock, urchins, pink coralline algae and often few fish is an area substantially untouched by longspine urchins. Something else entirely. Something amazing. A place of purple trees and green skies. A place like one above water, but not. A place with lowlands. And highlands. And everything in between. With vertebrates, invertebrates, algae and more, Countless shapes, colours, forms and behaviours, layers of life extending up from the bottom. A vibrant place that almost hums with life and movement. A garden of Eden, but we may lose the garden. The urchins are eating their way in. Here on a margin we see many urchins and a few remnant sponges and other invertebrates which are probably not consumable by urchins. Some species have defences, but even they may not last without their community. Our side scan data shows this Garden of Eden is on the same continuous reef as long spined urchins. There are no natural sand barriers and we have just seen the urchins are encroaching. Knowing how fast this garden is being converted to an environment of coralline algae and urchins and how much may have been lost already needs work. This garden and others are deeper than can be seen from the air and so repeated underwater transects over time are needed. This film has been driven by our concern for places like this. Flourishing places, places we find and celebrate, explore and share. Are they being lost? Could they disappear without a whisper under the waves? Putting aside the vexed and divisive question of whether human heavy fishing caused the barrens, a question which desperately needs more research to answer conclusively and quickly, is this also about what people value? Do we want to lose places like this? Is it worth trying to save some and learn as much as we can while we can? Is just the reasonable possibility barons were caused by humans enough for urgent action? We want to help find solutions. Perhaps an urchin harvesting structure which could help places like this, where the value of the harvest can be measured by row, by what is saved, and even by what is restored. A harvesting structure that engages First Nations people in protecting sea country. A harvesting structure where we can learn what is achievable, what works, what doesn't, and how many urchins need to be removed. Some barrens have quite low urchin densities and removal may be easier than we think. 
Just like parts of the Great Barrier Reef have had active defence from the endemic crown of thorn starfish, we believe some special places in New South Wales need defence from endemic long-spined urchins. We need to find and care for amazing places that remain. More research is needed on the dynamics of our predators and barrens, but continuous rocky reef with coralline algae and urchins is not rare habitat. Is it fragile? Is it productive? It seems to be close to the dominant continuous rocky reef habitat for up to 600 kilometres of New South Wales coastline. Flourishing kelp and sessile invertebrate habitat on continuous reef is rare. Rocky headlands with flourishing reefs are rare. Nearshore habitat for lobster and abalone seems rare. And New South Wales urchins are continuing to supply larvae and problems to Tasmania. Is there an opportunity to change this? What might be possible? What do we all want? So what would happen if you're looking at recovering an urchin barren by taking away most of the urchins is first you've got to remove, I mean the urchins look like little aliens on a desert, so you've got to remove those and, and you've got to remove a lot of them because you need much lower numbers than a normal ecosystem would even sustain to allow the recovery to happen. So first you've got to get them all off, you'd end up with a patch of bare rock, but then slowly you'd start to get the small propagules of seaweeds and things popping up their heads, you'd need a macro scale um, camera to be seeing those small changes. But you would just see different types of seaweeds popping up, different species fighting for their territory because there's many different types of seaweeds. Uh, first ones that come in are very tolerant to light, then you start getting your bigger kelps that um, and start anchoring more structure on the reef. And then you start bringing in fish that can hide um, and their juvenile fish can actually be protected from predators um, in and amongst that kelp. So you'd suddenly start to see from a blue desert landscape, um, a, a landscape flowing with macroalgae as well as all of the little fish and animals coming around them and predators lurking just offshore looking to catch the, the fish that uh, come out of their hiding places. Hmm. Abalone returning to those kelp beds will be really important. One of the predators that will be returning to kelp forests where they hide their young juvenile forms but also support large predators are the lobsters and the lobsters will start eating the sea urchins again helping to keep the numbers down. So recovering macroalgal and seaweed forests um, is important for the whole food chain. And so the recovery of seaweed and kelp habitats can be very fast and, and be maintained as long as you keep the predators and other organisms there that support it. A complete shift from a coralline barren to a complete kelp forest between 1993 and 1995. It was just amazing. We would, within months, be able to see the beginnings of a recovery of an ecosystem that is higher than the surface of the rock itself, which is all we're seeing now. Um, and within a year, you wouldn't recognize the habitat most probably because it will be a flowing, colorful, diverse habitat with all sorts of organisms swimming in and out and through it. Huge uh, frontier of export opportunities, especially for Australia, because we have a very strong biotech sector. And the biotech sector is looking for all of the next natural sources of um, molecules that it can use and understanding how those molecules work and you need to have an abundant supply of those molecules as well and because we've got the urchins at, at the barrens as they are there's a huge supply there but uh, all the way from agricultural fertilizers putting trace elements back into agriculture to really high value compounds um, and sea urchins are pretty interesting because they've got um, a special type of collagen that's actually there to control the way the spines on the urchin rotate and that type of collagen its molecular structure and how it can move things is is quite unique and so there's opportunities to use those materials uh, in medical devices and you know maybe smart smart materials that we haven't even thought of today it's vital for our own health that we can sustain the fisheries and the ocean nu nutrients that support us um, as well as uh, the ecosystem in itself supporting other important services such as taking up nutrients, carbon dioxide and waste streams that we're also putting into the oceans. And without that seafood resource, 
um, we suffer. Our coastal people, Aboriginal people for tens of thousands of years have looked after themselves and their health by eating from our coastal ecosystems and aren't able to do so as much anymore. You only need to talk to local Aboriginal people in Ulladulla talking about you know, picking up lobsters this big in abalone at the ankle depth water. We don't see that anymore. We don't know that. We've never seen that. Um, the number of scallops and all sorts of things that used to be collected in giant hessian bags, we don't know that because we don't see it anymore. And so there's so much uh, recovery that will, could happen we're not even anticipating because we're not aware of what was. But we stand to gain a lot because it was those, those marine resources that supported us getting to the state that we're in today. And now we need to start working out what's the cycle of life that we can sustain on our coastline for our own long-term gain and as well as the system that's supporting us. Both Dr Winberg and Professor Stenick noted recovery back to kelp by removal of urchins is challenging. Global successes were small in scale because of the numbers of urchins that needed to be removed or crushed in place. Professor Stenick did raise Maine, USA as an example where intense harvesting led to a complete transformation from barrens to kelp over a significant area. There also needs to be sufficient predators to cope with young urchins or the kelp cover may not be sustained. Snapper may be found to be a key predator in New South Wales and there are concerns the stock is under pressure and large fish are rare. If we could agree that barrens are not fragile, rare or very productive and there is a reasonable possibility the barrens are linked to historical heavy fishing then could New South Wales start aggressively and scientifically testing urchin population reduction in targeted areas? With First Nations people an integral part of projects, learning as much as we can about reef types, life that comes back and when and how long it lasts, how predation works and what is possible. We may even find early economic wins like healthy harvestable urchins as kelp comes back. We may find our marine sanctuaries pay off with faster and more robust recoveries by having more and larger predators. Is a national long-spined urchin strategy possible, with policies for overpopulations in one state and invasions in others, all three states working towards the possibility of hundreds of kilometres of more kelp, more large fish, more abalone, more lobster, more life and better health?